Hey guys, this is Mike Mahaffey, the old bastard BJJ guy, here for BJJ Metal Models. Back in my day, we had to walk uphill in the snow both ways to get to the academy just to learn some crappy technique from a random purple belt. You kids have it so easy, because now you can just subscribe to BJJ Metal Models Premium and get tons of great audio courses to learn new techniques, enhance your mindset, and entertain yourself. You can even get personalized rolling reviews from some of your favorite BJJ Metal Models coaches, including me. It's like having your own seminar, you spoiled little whippersnappers. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to BJJ Metal Models Premium right now, get off my lawn, and go train. Welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 278. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, I'm back with the Estonian defensive strategist, for now anyway, Mr. Preet Mikkelsen. How's it going, Preet? Uh, so far, so good. Life is good. I am glad to hear. Now, this is going to be a unique conversation, I think, and uh, one that is honestly a little bit surprising to me. So, for the listeners who aren't familiar, Preet is, I think you're probably our most frequent guest. If you count all of the appearances that you've done for us on our premium feed, you've been on here, I think about a dozen times or more. And of course, the thing that you're best known for is defensive BJJ and the framework that you built around that. And I've heard nothing but good things about it from the people I know who've adopted it, like our mutual friend Kabir Bath. I know that he uses it and teaches it extensively at his school as a great tool for white belts to keep them safe and get them going faster and to help them build up confidence as they learn. But for the listeners who don't know, you reached out to me a few days ago and said that you're scrapping all of that and you've changed your mind. And so I was a bit kind of confused about this. I wanted to get your thoughts on what this new this new philosophy is that you have towards jujitsu and what's changed. Well, you know, I'm always, when I'm teaching, I'm using feedback and I'm always saying like, you should listen to feedback, what people give you. And if critique is honest and, uh, you know, people have a goodness in their heart and stuff. So it makes sense to listen. And, and uh, I changed a bit things and I'm now going more towards offensive BJ and, and uh, maybe it was time to, you know, I didn't nicely back up my bag, back, you know, up my bags and uh, take it advice from Reddit, let's say. And take advice to the heart and uh, really like uh, go to the offensive side of things because it seems like uh, they were right. Yeah. And uh, we don't see anybody using the offensive stuff in matches. So they're right. Like, you know, where's the evidence and why I'm pushing this like a madman. And uh, it was time to change and go with, uh, you know, what we see in matches and maybe like give up, so to speak, what I did before and go with the hurt. So that's actually a really noble thing. And I'm so impressed that you had the humility to do that. Pre Most people, when they're confronted with evidence that what they're doing doesn't work, they double down. And I think it's great that you took all of that feedback to heart. You know, I've had you on the podcast for many, many times over the years. And the one thing that I've always wondered is if defense is so great, how come you only ever see fights end with offense, right? I mean, you see fights end by armbar, you see fights end by Kimura, but I've never seen someone win a fight by turtling. And so just by observing with my own two eyes, it's quite clear that the, the evidence tells us that offense works because it's visible and defense, because you don't always see it clearly, it's obvious that it doesn't work. And there's been a growing groundswell of people, especially on Reddit, who have really clued into this. And I think when the masses on Reddit speak, you always want to take their feedback, right? You've got, I think, 700,000 people there, some of the best and most studied white belts in the world. I mean, the amount of time that they spend on posting and talking on Reddit, you can tell these are people who have done a tremendous amount of research. So I think it's great that you were able to put aside your own experience in the art and your own belt ranking and listen to this whole army of white belts who clearly are onto something, right? I mean, they wouldn't all be saying this and coming to the same conclusion unless they were right, because that's just the law of crowds, right? If everyone agrees on something, it's definitely got to be right. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I only have, I will consider one win by winning by defense. It was, uh, I think, 2017. And that's that was my only evidence, basically. I rolled with some pretty decent brown belt and I did my thing, you know, and then finally he, he said, what's the effing point? And he left, you know, and uh, you know, we never rolled again after that. So I consider this a win, but it's, you know, it's just 
one win against uh, all the offensive wins we have seen. So, um, and also I don't think the way I won was really good, you know, and if I would keep promoting this, so to speak, and people will also lose friends and, you know, and it is a social game, so to speak. And if we refuse to play it, then the play the way I, you know, it seems I promoted it. And then people will have like a bad experience in a gym and gyms would lose money. People would leave gyms. It was time to change and, uh, you know, that kind of face my stubbornness. So actually, it's like a relief a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to go forward and, and yeah, change my mind. So what are your thoughts on your old defensive framework then? I mean, I use a lot of defensive stuff like Turtle. Of course, I'm a big Turtle player and I've adopted pieces of your old defensive framework into my system. But again, like you, I have listened to all of the feedback from people on the Internet and I've seen the upvotes. And it's pretty clear that even if what I'm doing in the gym seems to be working, it obviously isn't because there's just so much public evidence and such a groundswell against this. So I've actually abandoned a lot of defensive stuff. And now I just try to end a fight as fast as I possibly can. So I'm in there, you know, trying to choke people from inside their guard or leg lock them while we're still standing up. You know, I always want to try to do things to end the fight quickly because martial arts are all about efficiency and there's nothing more efficient than ending the fight in five seconds. So I've kind of moved away from things like turtle and hawking, and now I'm doing stuff like standing Ezekiel chokes and things like that. I'd love to know how your framework has adapted now that you've switched to offense instead of defense. Well, I will also add to this what you said. Turtle is bad in a way that it's also a bad habit because we've seen correct memes in internet are saying like if you, you know, my coach always says if you turn your back to your opponent, he always chokes you. And you can't do it in life also if you turn your back to the problems, you know, whatever. So it is like a bad philosophy overall, you know, turn your back and avoid facing things. And I think in that sense also, I have abandoned things because it is overall a bad habit that maybe trickles down to real life, so to speak. And that's why it was dangerous that people maybe took it too literally and uh, went too deep with it. So I kind of maybe even same no, I, I did maybe too much damage, so to speak. So, but yeah, my thing was been like it was just attack everywhere, you know, buggy chokes from like you know bad positions, and uh, you know here and there like Ezekiel's from inside close guard or side control bottom, like uh, even Craig Jones has been doing this. So finding offense anywhere I can and uh, building uh, my style, my ideas up from there. Nice. Now, what would you say are some of the foundations of a fully offensive game, right? Because we've talked to you extensively about the foundations of defense. And as we've established here, clearly that doesn't work, right? There's no evidence that defense is helpful or important. So if we're going to be focusing just on offense, what are some of the things that an offensive grappler wants to do to make sure they always win the fight and win it fast and effectively? Well, jumping on submissions any way you can. A lot of Things you wouldn't expect inside close guard, certain Americanas, or you can do like can openers, wrist locks from inside close guard. So attacking really from everywhere, because I guess the common attacks with people know, but I'm also a big fan of now the developing offense from those before known defensive positions. So now it's like uh, full on finding different ways and doing things fast because it's all about racking up like uh, wins during the sparring. So, and obviously, best submission is the quickest one. What you do, you know, and then you, have, the more you rack them up, the better. You win more fights. Before, I was like more patient, looking for options, you know. But now it's just any option I get, I jump on it. And obviously, with speed and hopefully control. And then that has been the main change for me. A lot of those kind of attitudes in all the positions. Nice. That makes a ton of sense, honestly. You know, you talked about the importance of the element of surprise. And we've said on the podcast many times that your techniques are going to be more effective if your opponent does not see them coming. So it's always best to be kind of secretive and to mask your intentions. And my criticism, and I think the internet's criticism of defensive jujitsu, it's very predictable, right? I mean, if you get on my back, Preet, you know what defenses I'm going to do. I'm going to try to block the choke. I'm probably going to try to put my shoulders on the mat. It's very obvious what someone's going to do when you're on their back and they're trying to defend. But what the person on your back never expects is for you to try to go on offense from there, right? I mean, when you've got someone on your back, why not darse them? Or why not, you know, try to bite their hand or do something like that? They're never in a million years going to see that coming. And if you catch someone off guard with something crazy like that, it's obviously going to be more effective, right? That's just science. Yeah, yeah, because... 
you're right because I've actually been bitten once in my early career in jiu-jitsu and I was on somebody's back and they were defending by biting me. I wasn't ready for that, you know. It's kind of like a full circle, you know, that I didn't get that early days. I kind of maybe uh, ignored the evidence, what was effective, and I somehow went to other side of the things. But now it seems that those old kind of like uh, lessons uh, came to haunt me, and then finally I had to give in. And now all the, that this kind of strange memory from my past that actually happened, kind of was like, ah, now I get it, you know, and offense everywhere, even, you know. If necessary, train with biting. So it's all part of the jiu-jitsu and that gets you ready. Of course, absolutely, right? I mean, this is fundamentally a combat sport and you have to be ready for any rule set, including those that allow things like biting and eye raking, right? So you obviously don't want to to nerf the sport and have your opponents take away valuable tools that could come up in competition. And that's a great example too of where, I guess earlier in your journey, you know, some crazy white belt bit you and showed you that defense just doesn't work against that kind of thing. And sometimes it takes a long time for us to accept those lessons because it goes against everything that we've been told. I know that you are a big advocate of moving away from traditionalism in jiu-jitsu, like the clapping your hands and the bowing on the mat and all of that, because it kind of just turns the brain off to some extent. And I think if you just take technique advice from your instructor all the time, who's telling you defense is important. I mean, if you take that feedback to heart, then you're never going to develop an offensive winning mindset. I mean, as an example, we had some guy in our gym, a new white belt who I took his back in about five seconds and I expected him to defend. Uh, He didn't bite me. But what he did is he tried to reach down and toehold me while I was on his back because I guess he'd seen that on YouTube or something. And that was very offensive and it caught me off guard. And I tried every defensive trick that I could do to get out and I just couldn't get out of that toehold. And the way I finally got out was I went on the offensive as well. I was on this guy's back and I grabbed his nose and I just cranked it as hard as I could and it changed the angle so he couldn't do the toehold anymore. So the lesson I think that I learned there is, look, if you are a white belt with an offensive mindset and you just go for it all the time, you can beat black belts, right? You can put them on the defense. I think we're brainwashing people when we tell them defense is important because we're just conditioning people to never attack, right? And I mean, obviously the people on Reddit have picked up on that. And I think it's good that now you and the rest of the community are catching up to their wisdom here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like uh, I think Jay Road even, even won US trials with this finals with the buggy choke also. So he was not defending, he was attacking. So that was also some kind of wake up call that offense is from all the positions. You don't need to, if you're side control bottom, who needs defense? And maybe your coach, like you said correctly, like maybe your coach doesn't know everything, like, oh, you should be defending him. But why not, you know, like I said, buggy choke them. Even if you fail 10 times, but that's the point, you know, and then the 11th time, maybe you pull it off. You start with the smaller white belts, you buggy choke them, and you climb the ladder. So it is the point of. Jiu-Jitsu is the win. It's not survival, so to speak. It is you want to win the fight. In a fight, in that sense, if your life is in danger, you want to win also. This attitude, I think, just being offensive in all kinds of way from all the bad positions. And also, obviously, putting yourself in a risk doing that. But if you train enough, you can pull this off. And we have enough evidence that this works compared to the defensive side of things that I really earlier promoted. So it all makes kind of sense. In a way, it's shameful to admit that, you know, now I changed my mind. It's called, you can flip-flop, whatever the politicians usually say. But also I'm happy and relieved that, you know, a lot of things are clicking to its place. And I am really happy to move forward from here. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Now, in terms of the principles of offensive jujitsu, some things that I've observed, and you tell me if you agree, when I got my black belt and I was trying to improve and accelerate my learning, I did what my instructor told me, and I focused on having a solid defensive foundation and on holding position and staying safe, right? You talked about how the goal of jiu-jitsu is survival, escaping, staying safe. And so that's how I trained for a long time. But then I saw some Instagram memes that really changed my mind on this, and they showed the power of going on offense. So before I would go to class and I would try to roll safely and slowly and methodically and defend and stay safe. But now I have flipped that thinking. And my job is I want to go in there and I want to get taps as quick as possible so that I can finish that round and then go and move on and tap someone else instead. So what I've actually found, of course, is this training style works much better when you're a black belt and everyone else is a brand new white belt. Because if I'm sparring with other black belts, they're going to be good enough that I can't just cut through their defense in five seconds. 
But if I'm with a white belt, you know, I can ankle lock them from inside their guard. I can cross collar and Ezekiel them while they're trying to sweep me, right? I got a lot of options to end that fight quickly. So I've noticed that before when I was playing defensively, I wouldn't get that many submissions in the gym. But now that I'm going for these flash instant submissions on day one white belts, I'm coming out of class with like three dozen taps in the same class. I mean, if that's not data that proves I'm getting better, I don't know what is. Yeah, I agree with you. And then uh, also the white belts, they see what works. Because if you just play around, uh, you know, play defense and stuff, they're adapting to this and they're thinking this is jiu-jitsu and it's that easy. But if you tap them, they're also always connected to reality. And a good thing with doing this, they start to treat other white belts like this. If they get better, they will pass on that tradition, so to speak, of rolling this way. I think it's like awesome for a gym and it will be very, very offensive uh, gym in that sense. People are really connected to reality. They're really fighting. And also people's egos are always in check because people tap a lot. I see many, many great benefits of rolling this way, especially with beginners. Because they have to know their place, so to speak, that they are beginners and they're there to that to hire belts to goof around with them and they're like moving dummies. So that's their place. This way you can really show them exactly where they belong and they they keep that on and show other beginners so they would really know their place and you'll have a really like peaceful and really nice like a uh, family gym. So I think there's many other good angles here also. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if your gym is 100% offense-based and your students are always trying to kill each other every class and they're racking up a ton of injuries and having to take time off, like people are going to look in at that from the outside and they're going to realize this gym is legit, right? I mean, no one's going to want to go to the gym down the street where they train safely and they use the ecological approach and, you know, there's a diverse, inclusive group of students that don't leave. No one's going to want that when you can go to a fight club and basically, you know, reenact that scene with Edward Norton and Brad Pitt where you mash someone's face in. That's what we're looking for here is we want to bring the art back to its founding roots and show people how effective it is. And there's no better way to do that than to use meme submissions on all of the white belts who come in to try your class for the first time. Yeah, it builds toughness, you know, it is a martial art. And uh, yeah, I found like we'd already talked like, you know, 20 minutes or almost there's like really nice side effects. What, what will happen if you start to be more offensive? Because it is very important that we stay connected to what is, what is reality, and that people know where they belong. So tap is a tap because that's the main point of the sparring round. So get the tap as fast as you can. You know, if possible, uh, keep count. You know how much you tap people because it matters because it's like a, your perception of self is way better because you know what you have done and you have a count and stuff and you like you exactly know how many times you tap that guy. So I think in all kinds of levels, you really know where you are, so to speak. Or, okay, this guy tapped me this time. I tapped him 10 times. So I think for like knowing where you are and what do you have to do to get better, I think it's uh, awesome that you're like a, the self-awareness of your situation and how to move forward in jiu-jitsu. I think it really helps. Now, something I want to ask you, and maybe this is going to be a bit controversial, but there are still people in the jiu-jitsu community who believe that defense is important. So, for example, John Danaher, generally considered to be one of the greatest coaches practicing today. Gordon Ryan, almost certainly the greatest no-gi grappler practicing today. Both of them have said repeatedly that defense is the foundation for your offense, and you need to be a master of defense. What are your answers to that? I mean, how do we stand up to people like that who are considered the best in the world, but they're making these obvious mistakes? What would you say to, to John Danaher and Gordon to educate them on the, the right way to be offensive when they're grappling? Well, the evidence, where's the evidence? We don't see much uh, use of the offensive side. So that's the first thing. Yeah. Where is the evidence? You know, if you watched last UFC fight pass, the Meragali was fighting, he was offensive. He was choking, the, he was winning by re, re naked choke from the back. And uh, it wasn't like defensive side of things. It was all offense. So I would say also, where's the evidence? So for my part also, what I can clearly attest that uh, my schedule is right now pretty booked, but I'm afraid if I open it up now for offensive seminars, I think it's even crazy how much it will be booked ahead. Even if I'm doing okay with right now, let's say I'm booked a year ahead. I think if now the offense comes out and people know what I do, I think it's even like crazy how many years I will get booked ahead now. So that's interesting evidence also to monitor. But for yeah, where's the evidence? It's all offense and that's what sells. So I think people talk about it, but it's like a fashionable to talk about it because that's how 
maybe Jiu-Jitsu started, you know, like uh, Helio Gracie even said, I think it's about uh, being uncomfortable, being comfortable in very uncomfortable position. But uh, I didn't see Meragali being very uncomfortable. He was very comfortable, actually, when he was choking somebody. I think uh, the message has been lost. I don't know why it was said this way, because obviously it's totally opposite. I'm happy that I got out of from, from that mindset, because... It really may be like a, I was like under a spell or something. I was pushing it. I didn't see it. But now it's clearly like uh, evidence is out. I don't think it's undisputable, so to speak. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, as we know, a lot of people in jiu-jitsu, they're not trained at critical thinking and it's such an important skill. And this is a great example because, look, I mean, Gordon Ryan can say whatever he wants about the importance of defense, but I've watched his matches and I know how those go, right? He's going to bring out the little box and in it, he's going to have a, like a picture of a triangle or an arm bar or something. He's going to call his shots and he's going to say how he's going to win the fight. And it's always an offensive move. I've never seen Gordon open up a box and say, I'm going to win by turtling or I'm going to win by giving up my back, right? It's always a submission. So I think the lesson there is that even Gordon isn't thinking critically about this when he says defense is important because, you know, I'm seeing this with my own two eyes and he's doing it with his own two hands. He's going in there and winning by submission every time, you know, until he goes in and he wins by giving up his back. It's pretty clear that's not a good strategy. And so what's the point in learning back defense at all when you could just spend that time learning the submissions? I even think that it's a it's a strategy actually from John Donahue and Gordon that they're like talking about defense because I think it's... Uh, they do it by purpose because they're saying those defensive things and uh, all the you know opponents are like, oh shit, this is it. And they start to practice that more. And clearly they don't train so much offense after that. And that's why I think a lot of the new wave guys have easier time winning because they're like misleading people and making them train defense because they're advocating it so much. Everybody thinks that's their secret, you know, like, oh, in new wave, we train a lot of defense, but actually I don't think they do. And it's a, it's a major, it's a, very, very effective strategy that's been also one reason why they're so effective because the message has been out for a couple of years and uh, people are listening, obviously, and training defense, but clearly you have less time to train offense after that. And if they're only training offense, obviously they will be better and they will be beating everybody. And uh, they have been doing this like constantly. So uh, kudos for them. I think it's like a brilliant strategy to just uh, kill the competition by spreading their false information. Finally, you know, I saw it and I think more people will see it and, and maybe it balances out. But so far, major, major awesome strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can speak for it myself. Like the other day, I was sparring with a world champion here in Vancouver. I mean, I've got no business beating a world champion, right? Or even going toe-to-toe with them. And normally I go in there and I try to do jujitsu the way that I was taught. But I thought, what would happen if I just try to explode and submit this person from every single position, right? And what happened is, you know, I was going nuts and they took me down, they passed my guard, they mounted me, and I was trying to just freak out from the bottom. And without them even putting on a submission, I dislocated my own shoulder because I was going so intense. And so the instructor came by and stopped the match as a no contest. And that's a big deal to have a tie with a world champion. I mean, that tells me this works. In the past, I would never go to a tie with a world champion, but because I was able to get this to an injury stoppage, even if it was me, the record book in the gym will forever show that I'm just as good as that world champion and I owe it all to offensive BJJ. Yeah, it makes sense. I think it was a good strategy from your side because if you would be just defending and you wouldn't try and not many things would have happened, but then you went really hard and did your best. And then it was rewarded by you having a tie and then it means something. So we can't really deny it. So I'm, I'm happy for your performance. Thank you, sir. I know at this point what I'm capable of. So I'm thinking I'm going to do an Abu Dhabi run in a few years because clearly I was a lot better than I had ever assumed. And I think the defensive strategies were holding me back because I was afraid to try things. Right. And I mean, yes, my arm is hanging kind of loosely and I can't lift up my coffee anymore. But I will forever have that win in the gym, or I guess a tie in the gym, until the day I die, right? No one can take that away from me. So again, offense matters because people remember when you do something crazy and stupid, right? No one remembers when you win a fight by on points by boring, methodical, proper defensive jiu-jitsu. People are only going to remember when you do something totally stupid and crazy. And so, like you said, right, if we want to make money, why not focus on doing the things that are memorable? Yeah, and your match... Kind of reminds me of the, I think, the Jacare and Roger Gracie match, yeah? 
And Roger kind of, I think, broke Jacare's arm a bit. But do you remember who ended up winning that match? I don't remember. So I'm going to guess they must have been using a defensive strategy because if it was pure offense, I surely would have remembered. Because I would even say, so off the top of my head, I know that Jacare was circling, circling. So maybe he was ahead of my points, but clearly, you know, his offensive skills and stuff. And after even he, if he arm was broken, you know, it was a part of his strategy. So to be offensive inside the armbar even, and then it kind of helped that he escaped the armbar fully. And then he could just actually, I think he, uh, he he took the win. I think it is. So he was, I remember that the ending part. So yeah, it, it's been done before, but it's usually been ignored in that sense. And I'm going fully forward. And also I want to say that sometimes just doing, like you said, in those defensive positions that people don't expect you to do those things, you know, and that's also gives you an edge because uh, let's say in a mount, they expect you to have like your arms maybe close to your neck, you know, something and they're like expecting certain defensive moves. But then if you do something unexpected, you know, offensive and everything, so it could throw them off. And in this case, like your case, it actually got rewarded because you got injured and, you know, it got us a tie. So it clearly, clearly, this is something that he wasn't expecting. And then he had like a knee jerk reaction to it and actually injury happened. It's been proven before. And I think it's very, there's a lot of, you know, very strong evidence that this is the way forward. And yeah, we'll see what comes out of that. We keep building the system, adding different layers and stuff, and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Well, let's talk about that system. I mean, I'm guessing that in the next few weeks, you're probably going to rebrand the DefensiveBJJ.com site and have it redirect to your new site, Offensive BJJ. But if people sign up there, what can they expect to see? What kind of material are you planning to put out there to begin with? Yeah, I think it's not going to be hard. I would say I would start to add a lot of offensive stuff from those defensive positions inside you know, gl- inside the guard top and then mount bottom, side control bottoms. So because obviously other areas are well more studied, but attacking from all kinds of bad positions that is understudied in jiu-jitsu really i feel that uh, my help there is needed and i have uh, already experienced there i've done the defensive stuff before so it's for me it's super easy to add offensive stuff and i don't think it's gonna be actually a hard change because defensive bj system has uh, has laid a really strong foundation for it and i think in a couple of weeks we film all the videos and stuff so i also i can assure people that I know what I'm talking about because I was the guy that was super defensive so to add offensive moves from there and uh, I really know they fit and I know what I'm talking about and it's gonna be a painless change I think that's the first stuff we're gonna do all kinds of offensive moves from those seemingly defensive positions that we know now was actually very uh, like they were actually very deceiving in their nature so now we know more Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can say from my own experience, you know, I used to be a turtle player and I would play that doing the proper things that people told me to do, like doing, you know, a Peterson role or trying to get up or take them down from there or regard. But what I've started doing now is I just go for a donkey kick. I mean, if you don't know what that is, is how like a donkey or a mule is going to kick you. You lift up your back legs and you try to kick the person behind you. And I've only had one role where I got to try that. And the other guy got so mad that he stormed off and I got kicked out of the gym. But that's still a win. And as soon as I find another gym that will let me train there, I'm going to try it again. Because right now, I mean, I've got a 100% success rate with that technique. I won my, my one attempt by forfeit. And so I'm pretty sure that if I just keep stopping in and trying these other gyms and, and donkey kicking everyone, I think I can find a way to make turtle a really powerful offensive tool. So just another example of how helpful it can be to think offensively all the time from every position, even when your coach says it actually doesn't make sense, you should still be doing it. Yeah. And it's like your thinking seems to be really out of the box and those kind of things, you know, in a real fight, in that sense, you should expect somebody did that. So I think it's very important to train really in a representative environment where things that actually happen can happen. And I think people should be ready, you know, for those things, because I think that offense was legit, you know, they should be ready. And it's, uh, I agree with you, it's a clear win. It's not your fault. I think a little bit like, I think it will be accepted around the world easier because I, the defensive stuff got really good, really like major pushback. So I think when we go offensive and we, we explain our reasoning, like we're doing it right now, 
I think people also that the gym that you got kicked out from, I think the people realize what did you do and why you're beneficial for a gym. Because either you want to be a traditional one, like, you know, not sparring, only some self-defense stuff, or you really want to be ready for whatever happens. So I think that mindset is about to change and uh, people just need a little bit of reasoning. And I, I think this is not rare that more people will start to do your stuff. And I'm hoping also that, you know, like I said, your thinking seems to be out of the box a little bit. So you will come up some uh, with new th- stuff even to push the offensive community even to higher levels. I'm excited to also, you know, hear later after a couple of weeks what you come up with. Absolutely, man. I will definitely keep you informed. And yeah, like you said, because there was so much pushback about telling the community to prioritize defense, I'm certain that all of those people are going to love this and they'll probably never say a bad thing about you again, right? Because this is what they wanted the whole time. I mean, that's just common sense. You know, if you watch the uninformed people watching the USC, they don't want to see good quality grappling. They want to see someone get knocked out in 10 seconds, right? That's really where the foundation of martial arts are. It's going on the offensive and just throwing caution to the wind so that you can wind up being an Instagram highlight reel for someone, right? Because that, that's way more valuable. I mean, you could win slowly and boringly, or you could get knocked out or knock the other person out in spectacular fashion and still maybe lose, but lose in a very famous way, right? And that has value itself. Sometimes it's not about winning the battle. It's about winning the war. And what better way to win the war than to do crazy high risk stuff and get knocked out in spectacular fashion and become a fan favorite? Yeah, no, I think we will have less boos, uh, booing also in UFC, you know. Usually when you see some people doing jiu-jitsu, it is kind of boring, you know. Both posts are playing safe. And uh, I think this way, you know, with a wave of offensive jiu-jitsu, I think we have, like you said, we have more scoring both ways, people taking risks, you know, and fights are getting more interested. And I think this is a really good step towards common fan that doesn't understand your groundwork and we will bring the sport closer to them, so to speak, because we will make it more entertaining. People you know, are willing to take more risks and more stuff will happen. So I think even UFC you know, attendance number, pay-per-view numbers, in the end, we can also push them up because more people, they like Shujitsu and they tune in for those because now actually that the groundwork is competing with the striking because striking is very, very offensive, you know, and a lot of things can happen in striking. So now even I think in groundwork, I think we can match it. We can make us as exciting as a stand-up. So for me, times ahead, what is coming, are very, very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's as good a time as any to plug your new offensive BJJ site. It's not live yet, but if anyone goes to defensivebjj.com and signs up there, within a few weeks, it should transfer over and you'll see all of the new offensive material And I mean, I've taken a sneak peek at some of Preet's offensive stuff, and I just can't recommend it enough. It's amazing content and it's content unlike anything you will find on any of the other sites, right? I mean, if you want to learn how to Ezekiel choke someone who's mounted on top of you, Preet's site is the place that you go to do that offensive BJJ. I guarantee you none of the other academies are going to teach you that Lachlan is not going to teach you how to Ezekiel someone from bottom mount. So if you want to learn that kind of ultra effective, high risk, flashy offense, Go to defensivebjj.com, sign up there. And of course, like I said, that site will transition to full offense in a week or two. And as always, I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for people to sign up. But Preet, any closing thoughts? I can't thank you enough for coming by and sharing this. Was there anything else you wanted to add or talk about on the topic of offense for jujitsu? It was weird that because when we discovered the defensive stuff and I thought that was the only undiscovered niche of jujitsu, specialized on upper body defense and everything else. But uh, now with this, it's like a new continent, so to speak, that it's still, I think, for the attacking from, you know, those seemingly defensive positions, it's a different niche, but I think it's way deeper. We can go wider and deeper. I'm very happy. So what's left to say? Because I didn't think I could find another niche. And obviously, you know, criticism came and all the feedback and stuff, people came. So I was kind of like I was stuck in a corner a bit. So I'm very, very happy that I stumbled on this even like greater niche in jiu-jitsu, being very offensive from those positions. I only want to share my gratitude towards the Redditors, towards the passionate people that have ridden me and uh, who has given me critique and uh, who's bashed me and stuff. So I think it was the right thing to do. I think it, I really feel it came from the heart and I took it to the heart and finally I had guts to change my mind. So 
I really appreciate everybody and much love back. Well, thanks, Preet, as always. I'll also put a link to our stuff in the show notes. The podcast, the newsletter, our premium services live at bjjmentalmodels.com. Definitely recommend people sign up for the newsletter and subscribe to the podcast if they don't already, because those are completely free. And as everyone can tell from this episode here, our focus at BJJ Mental Models is always on providing high quality, accurate, evidence-based information to make you the best grappler possible. So again, all of that stuff is free there. And of course, if you want to kick it up to the next level and join our premium service, you will get access to our entire course library, plus direct rolling reviews from our black belt coaches who will tell you at the highest levels how you can do some of this crazy stuff. So if you've been practicing Rob Bernanke's roadhouse choke and you want to know, hey, can that be done from bottom half guard? Join premium, send us a rolling review, and we'll get a black belt to spend their time going through and telling you the answer. And I guarantee you they're going to love that process, as will you. So everything lives at bjjmentalmodels.com. And just like Preet's stuff, I will put a link in the show notes. But Preet, thanks so much for coming by today. Always an innovator, man. I love seeing the way that you change the sport. And like you said, I'm just so impressed that you're able to change your mind, right? I mean, look, those white belts on Reddit, they were clearly really certain about this approach. And there was a lot of them. And, you know, as a black belt, we need to be humble enough to acknowledge that sometimes the white belts are right. I think it's good that we've learned from them. Credit to all of the white belts who have uh, steered us along this direction over the years. Yeah, it's, it's all about leading from the front, you know? So I have to be an example. It's, it is a life changer for me, but I had to do it. So I really appreciate it. And it's it's the best way to go forward is to change yourself. So it's uh, yeah, all good. Amazing, man. Well, thank you so much, Preet. Thank you to all of the listeners as well. We'll talk to you next week. Take care. Okay, if you've listened all the way to the end here, I hope that by now you figured out that this is an April Fool's Day episode. Happy April Fool's Day from BJJ Mental Models.